Hey everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. Colleen Patrick Goudreau here and I am in Kigali. This is our last day in Rwanda. This is our last day in Rwanda and I'll tell you, it's going to be really sad to leave this country. We have had the most amazing time and if you're following me on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, etc., YouTube even, I've been putting some of the videos up on YouTube, you will uh, have seen the kinds of uh, activities we've done and the animals we've seen. So this is just a shot of Kigali in the morning. It's about, uh, let's see, what time is it? It's almost 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, Kigali time. And um, we're here at the beautiful Marriott Hotel. The very beginning of our trip to Kigali was at the Hotel Mil Colleen, and it was beautiful, but for the last... We've had to come back to Kigali a couple times and we are staying at the Marriott and really one of the reasons we're staying at the Marriott is because uh, we have been able to use our points. So if you travel a lot, make sure you join different clubs for different um, airlines and different hotels because we're staying in a junior suite for free because we were able to use our points to, um, to do so. So it's actually a real gift to be able to do that. And we have had the most amazing time. I invited you to ask questions about our trip to Rwanda here, and um, and I've been getting lots of questions from you, both solicited and unsolicited, and I've been answering them in videos, so hopefully you're watching those videos. And if you're interested in knowing really the whole scope of our trip and kind of what we did to plan for it, you can obviously go listen to my Food for Thought podcast episode in which I talked about our planning and preparation for this trip. It's called Planning and Preparing <laughs> for Africa. And uh, so you can go listen to that because I do talk about a lot of the uh, aspects of our trip. But of course, there's so much more to share with you because we couldn't know the answers to everything until we actually got here. So we've definitely, um, we've learned so much since we've been here. And I can safely say this is a life-changing trip. I'm, I'm so moved and impressed by the people of Rwanda. It's been very emotional. I've actually been very emotional, <laughs> like on the verge of tears and crying many times since we've been here because um, I'm so moved by the leadership of this country, having taken their, the Rwandans out of the most horrific period in their history, which was the genocide in 1994. And of course, we've seen many of the genocide memorials, and we'll share that with you. I, I definitely encourage people to do that. Uh, and just, just seeing how far they've come in such a short period of time, because 20 years ago was not that long ago at all. Uh, it's so impressive, and, uh, and I really have fallen in love with Rwanda. So it's our last day, and I'm going to be really sad to leave, but I can, I can say with confidence that I will come back. I really look forward to coming back to Rwanda. So we are heading to Botswana uh, today, tonight. Um, we're here in Kigali all day, which is nice. We're having kind of a relaxing day. Um, We'll just kind of, you know, upload all of our footage because, of course, we've all been taking lots of um, photos and videos and we'll probably walk around a little bit. It's raining. It's the first day it has rained. The weather has been absolutely beautiful since we've been here, everywhere we've been, both in the south and the north, and, uh, and we've really loved it. Today it's raining a little bit. It's just kind of drizzling. It may even stop. Um, we'll walk around a little bit and then we'll just kind of have a lazy day and then at 4 o'clock... We drive to the airport and we take a, a plane to Botswana, which is about a three hour flight. And then from there we stay over a night in Johannesburg just for the night. And then tomorrow morning we get, head to Botswana for our safari. And then we start our safari. So I have many more photos and videos of Rwanda and the gorillas and the chimpanzees and the golden monkeys and baboons. We saw baboons down south when we were in the forest trekking for chimpanzees. And I will share all of that with you and all of the questions you've had and my answers to them over the course of the next several weeks because there's so much to share with you. And now we'll be making videos and posting posts about... Um, about Botswana. So if you have any questions about Botswana and our safari, of course, I'll invite you to ask those as well. So if you have any questions for me while I'm here, before I go start my day, our friends, I think, just boxed us and I think we're about to go to breakfast. Uh, please, please ask them. Uh, it's an incredible place to come. And I really, what I've been so excited about is seeing people who are responding to my posts saying that now they're inspired to come to Rwanda. And that would be my hope is that uh, you would be inspired to come visit this amazing country. 
anytime soon. And, and even though there's hope for the animals, uh, especially the larger primates, um, the great apes, like the mountain gorillas, um, it's time to come see them now because it, it, it's, it's, animals are facing a lot of challenges and because of humans and there's a lot we can do and we need to do it. And, and I have a video about the gorilla tracks because some people have asked about the gorilla tracks and is it, is it okay for the gorillas that there are people there? And this was a big controversy when Diane Fossey was doing her work here. And there were, there were other workers who really wanted to have ecotourism, which is what you're really seeing now. And she was opposed to it. And I have to say, I really agree with the ecotourism aspect because if you don't create a financial incentive to sustain something like, unfortunately, sustain the lives of, um, of wild animals, in many cases, it's about wild animals, uh, without financial incentive, it's unfortunately, if you rely on just government subsidies, you're not really going to create a sustainable model. So, so you coming to see the gorillas, and it's not, it's not cheap, but it's worth it because you're not just coming, this isn't just, you know, about you having an opportunity to see the gorillas, you're actually contributing to their conservation because the money goes towards the protection of the habitat and the gorillas themselves. So it's worth every penny for their sake. Suzanne said animals worldwide are under most, more, much stress from our behaviors. It's true. Stephanie, thank you for all you do for the love of animal safe travels. Have a beautiful adventure. You're such an inspiration. Thank you. And hi, Jerry from California. I'm very emotional, so I can't guarantee I'm not going to cry <laughs> because it's been such an incredible week. I'd love to go see those magnificent animals. Never even considered it before, so thanks for the inspiration. I'm so glad, Dee. That means so much. And definitely make sure you're spending... I mean, we've been here a week. I would recommend spending the week in Rwanda. And the only thing we haven't done in Rwanda that we would come back to do again, I mean, there's lots, there's actually lots to do. And I'm, you know, staying down in Yungwe Forest, I would stay longer next time because it's so beautiful down there. And there's lots of hikes and lots of other things to do. Waterfall hikes and just, and, and there are um, Mona monkeys and, and mountain monkeys just all in the trees all around you in the forest. So it's not like you have to just go on a trek to see animals here. They're, they're everywhere, especially in the forest, obviously. But um, there's an eastern, the eastern part of Rwanda has another national park uh, called uh, Ak um, Akigera. Akigera. And Akigera is like a safari, meaning that the weather and the climate and the um, terrain is more conducive to safari animals. So you've got cheetah, you've got lions, you've got hippos and zebras and lots of other animals that people go to other countries for to see it, to go on a safari, like we're doing in Botswana. And I don't regret that. But next time we come back, perhaps we'll go to the eastern part and go to the um, Ak uh, Akigera uh, National Park. So there's lots to do. Spending the time here in Kigali has been absolutely worth it. And, uh, and going to the genocide museums. There's a, there's a genocide memorial in almost every town. I mean, it's, or at least region, county, um, over 200. I mean, it's everywhere. And there are <clears throat> many right around Kigali. And then the Kigali Memorial Museum, Genocide Memorial Museum, is right here in Kigali. And it's where 250,000 um, remnants of bodies are buried to give some peace to the families who, 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 those who are surviving to be able to come and pay tribute to their, to their lost family members from the genocide. Um, Jennifer, hi Jennifer, yay, and Jennifer, I can't wait. So Jennifer's coming with us on our trip to Thailand and our friends Seb and Bridie, who you'll see in many of our photos and videos, they're the ones who are organizing the trip to Thailand and we have so much fun traveling together is the reason why the four of us travel together all the time. And so I'm so excited you're going to be joining us, Jennifer, because the Thailand trip is going to be phenomenal because we're going to also see um, elephants in a sanctuary and we're going to go see gibbons in a rehabilitation sanctuary and we're just going to have a blast. So I'm so excited you're coming. And um, the Botswana safari experience, it's basically we're staying in a couple different camps. Uh, I can't remember the names of the places. I'll obviously be more familiar with them once we get there. But they're kind of, you know, a little more luxury. This is a Christmas present for the next 10 years for, for all of us. Uh, so it's a little more high-end because it's, we just want it to be comfortable. 
So we're staying in two different camps. So we'll be there for about five days total. And there are a couple of different kinds of safari treks you can do. You can do, uh, obviously we're going to be doing mostly the ones where you're just sitting in a Jeep. I don't think we're going to be exercising or walking at all for the next week. And then there's also some, there are some walking safari experiences you can have. And there's a night safari experience. So I'll know more when we get there. And then, of course, in every place, we've just told them about our, you know, our dietary preferences and how we eat. And everyone's just so lovely. We've been eating so much and abundance and delicious food. In fact, our friends are downstairs at breakfast right now. It's amazing. So uh, I'll let you know about Botswana more when we get there. But, uh, but we're really excited about that. And then the, on New Year's Eve, we're going to be in Zimbabwe because we're going to be at Victoria Falls, which is supposed to be absolutely amazing. And then we head on to South Africa. But that's a whole other, that's a whole other one. Um, let's see. Mario said, I heard from a TV show, Adam Ruins Everything, I think. Adam Ruins Everything, I think. Oh, interesting. Uh, African nations allow hunters to kill exotic animals and paying a lot of money that pays for preservation um, of the other luckier animals. True. Oh, absolutely true. I mean, absolutely. The hunting and, and industry is massive, whether you're talking about Western nations or African nations. If there's money to be made, absolutely. And it's not unlike what the United States does. And I can only speak for the United States because I'm most familiar with the policies in the United States. They talk about culls of wild animals because they're protecting uh, the, the numbers. Uh, they justify these kinds of hunting expeditions uh, using conservation and population control as an excuse. And it's absolutely an excuse because the problem isn't that there are too many animals in the world and we have to control them and, yet, and they have so much habitat to ro The problem is that we're infringing upon their habitat. Habitat encroachment is the number one threat of... Um, for wild animals around the world. And number two would be poaching, for sure. Um, well, I, I, want, I don't want to say it would be poaching, because in terms of volume of numbers, it's probably pretty small, but it's absolutely the biggest threat is coming from human encroachment upon their habitat. So yeah, I mean, it's not just African nations. We tend to think of wildlife, uh, exotic wildlife, being only in Africa because we pay and we spend money to come all the way here to see wild animals. For those of you who follow my feed, you know that I'm as excited about seeing a squirrel in my backyard or a robin in my backyard or a deer in my backyard as I am to come to see the gorillas and the lions and the elephants. For the people who live in the different countries where these different wild animals live, and we're talking about thousands, obviously, um, it's, it's, it's their... It's their wildlife, just like the deer and the squirrels and the foxes are our wildlife. The thing is, we don't value our wildlife, and, and, and we have the culls and the hunting expeditions just like it's done here. So it's no different. I just want to make sure that's clear. It's no different. Um, it's just that some of the ones who are being um, killed are, um, are, 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 you know, they're, they're threatened because of, their, um, because of the habitat encroachment. Um, Suzanne said, this year we fostered a baby elephant and giraffe from a sanctuary in Kenya instead of gifts to each other. I know David Sheldrick uh, Foundation. They're amazing. So yeah, if anybody wants to go, and I know I have a friend who goes to David Sheldrick every year and she goes and visits the, uh, the elephants she fosters. David Sheldrick Org Foundation, it's called, is a wonderful foundation. The guides and the, 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 the people who take care of the elephants uh, and other animals, um, most of them are orphaned because the elephant female mothers have been killed uh, for ivory or in one way or another. And so they, they nurse the babies and then eventually, obviously, they re reintroduce them back into the wild. And that's being done in many places, but we're, you know, we're losing the space to be able to send them back into the wild. We need to save their habitat. We need to protect their habitat while protecting the individuals from being killed. So David Sheldrick is absolutely a wonderful organization. The food is phenomenal. I'll talk more about it in another video because I just feel like I could just do an entire hour-long video on the food we've been eating here. Uh, we're about to go down to breakfast. The buffet here at the Marriott is massive. Uh, there's so much for us to eat. We're eating a ton of avocado and, um, and salads. We had some wonderful salads in Nyungwe Forest. We'll have potatoes here. We had Last night we had this delicious curry with a vegetable pilaf and 
rice pilaf and um, plantains and uh, it was just wonderful. We went down to the buffet and the buffet was 25,000 uh, uh, Rwandan francs and we said well we, we're only going to get about five things in this whole buffet. Would you be able to work with us so that um, we can either, you know, we can order a la carte and they charged us 5,000 um, Rwandan francs. So everyone's always willing to work with you and they kept saying go back and go back and get more. They felt like we weren't getting enough food. We're like we're completely full. We don't need any more food. Uh, so the food's been phenomenal. We just communicate with the with the, with the chefs, and we have had some wonderful conversations with the chef. The chef down in Yonge Forest made us pancakes for breakfast yesterday. Um, so I'll talk more about that in another episode or another, uh, well, more just videos, just just in general, and certainly on the podcast. Hey, Riza. Hey, Megan. Tina says, I've always wanted to go to Africa. Thanks for sharing your trip. It definitely changed what I thought Africa might be like. Well, that's my hope, Tina. My hope is to also... Sweetheart, can you get showered? They're down at breakfast. Yes. Okay. Um, they, um, uh, my hope is that it would inspire people because um, it's, it's been phenomenal. It, it, it's been life-changing, and I'm so excited that I could inspire people to come. Suzanne says they're knocking down trees around here to make way for condos, and yet I've seen two bears, several deer, raccoons passing through the spot, let alone all the birds and bugs. Uh, no one's, uh, but no one cares. It's for money. It's true, Suzanne. That, and that's, that's partly why I support things like ecotourism. I mean, look at whale watching. Whale watching is a great example. You know, we don't, we don't hunt whales anymore. I mean, you know, we used to, and of course there's some indigenous tribes who do, but we don't kill whales, you know, for their blubber, for instance, for their oil. But we, um, and that was a huge industry. I mean, that's how a lot of individuals made a lot of money. But now we have the whale watching uh, trips. And, and people pay a lot of money to go and watch the whales. That's a great example of ecotourism because there needs to be, unfortunately, there needs to be a financial incentive. And seeing the gorillas is one of those things. It has worked. There were 150 mountain gorillas left when Diane Fossey was killed in 1985, and there are 800 now. That's still very low. Eight, I think there's, there's more than 800, but it's about 800, a little more than that. That's still low, but if you start calculating all of the um, the births, you know, based on the number of males and how long it takes them to gestate, and you know, unfortunately their reproduction is very slow. But if you start calculating those numbers, there is absolutely hope for the survival of that species. But we need to protect their habitat, and the problem is the Congo is incredibly unstable and. There's not a lot of hope right now. I'm not someone who doesn't have hope. I always have hope. But Congo is one of these places that has been uh, unstable for many decades. So, um, but there's always hope. <laughs> so my point is money has to be an incentive. It ha there has to be a financial incentive. For those of us who care just for the sake of caring, we have to keep doing the work we care about. And we have to understand that creating these, I mean, really, humane economy uh, is, is, is what really makes a difference. So, I mean, I mentioned that a lot of the trekkers and the, the porters who come with you on these treks are former poachers. And, you know, I, I talk about this in episodes where I say that we can't even demonize slaughterhouse workers. There are a lot of people who do things that we would disagree with and find horrific uh, for money because they're trying to feed their families because, of course, economically there's a really unstable um, and uh, unequal system. Uh, so the, the poachers, a lot of people who poach animals aren't doing it because they want to destroy animals. They're doing it because they're being paid money to at least enable them to feed their families. So we have to be mindful of not being judgmental of everyone who does something to an animal that we are opposed to. As much as we're opposed to it, and we have to work to stop that. But where we see success is those poachers being paid to not poach but to actually protect the animals. So organizations who are working on the behalf of protecting animals and hiring former poachers, it's a model that we've seen works. And so that's an example with Rwanda. There's no poaching in Rwanda anymore because all of the poachers are now the protectors of these animals. It didn't it didn't it didn't require a shift in mindset. They already believed these animals, you know, were amazing animals, but they were being paid by someone else who had money to pay them to kill them. So now that they're being paid for by people to protect them, that's preferable to them. It's pretty dangerous to go out there and kill and kill animals. So they would prefer to protect them and not kill them. So that's all I want to say about that. And that's the same thing kind of all around. So financial incentives, you know, really drive, really drive, really drive a lot of policy decisions. 
So what else do you have? The chef uh, looked after you. Oh, yeah, the chef was amazing. I have some wonderful pictures of us with the chef. I can't believe we're so getting so close to wildlife either. It's amazing. I'll stop using the word amazing. Is Rwanda or Botswana or any other countries in Africa you'll be going to dangerous for LGBT people? Nick, that's a really good question. And actually, we were just actually talking about that last night. So uh, Rwanda, since 1912, Rwanda has had like legal, it's been legal for uh, um, same sex relationships in Rwanda since 1912, if I'm remembering this correctly. So it's not, there's not legal marriage yet, but I mean, legal marriage just, just happened in the United States, right? So I don't doubt that there's going to be a move towards legal, the legalization of marriage in a place like Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda also, the, um, over 60% of representatives in government in Rwanda are women. There is a government quota that 30% uh, of, of leadership positions in government need have to be women. So the quota is at least 30%. The quota is a minimum of 30%. So there are a lot of women in, uh, in leadership positions here in Rwanda. It's encouraged. It's like I said, it's a government mandate. And, and as far as LGBT, no, Rwanda, you are completely, completely uh, supported. I don't believe that it's necessarily encouraged for people to be affectionate on the streets, but I, I think that's the same for heterosexual couples. They're not necessarily overly uh, demonstrative in terms of sexuality. However, in terms of just affection and physical contact, it's a very physically um, affectionate country. I find there are a lot of, there's a lot of touching in, um, in among Rwandan people, you'll often see two men walking down the street holding hands or two women walking down the street holding hands, but those are friends. You don't see a lot of heterosexual couples, and I would guess homosexual couples, walking down the street holding hands, but you see that with just friends. So walking down the street and seeing two men hold hands, like who are just friends, is so wonderful to see. As progressive as we think we are in the United States, we're still so afraid of physical affection in some ways because we think it's going to reflect one way or another on our sexuality. So, so we have, we have things to learn and it's, you know, it's very traditional. It's very, um, however, in Uganda, for instance, um, they're persecuting, um, homosexuals. And of course it's, I, I think that's horrific. Botswana, I'm not as familiar with their other uh, laws, but we will find out. It's kind of what happens is as we go from country to country, we become more familiar with their practices and policies. I happen to know a little bit more about Rwanda just because I've been interested in Rwanda for so many years and I've read a lot about it and I'm so impressed with the government and their policies. So we will tell you more about Botswana. How, and keep in mind with Botswana, we're really not going to be interacting with locals a lot in Botswana. We're really going to be in these camps. So I'm probably not going to become as familiar with the Botswana um, people as we have become with Rwandan people. But it's a great question and I'm sure you can do more research on that. Uh, thank you, Beverly. Oh, I... I I'm just really grateful to be here. Uh, yeah, so so lots of lots of good questions and lots of good uh, lots of good thoughts. Lots to lots to take in. Lots to take in. Uh, love it. Yeah. So today we're pretty much gonna gonna hang out and um, have a lazy day. It looks like the rain is starting to subside. Uh, Angela, is it super busy tourist-wise or there's smaller crowds? No, we're not seeing, I mean, this is what's called kind of a bump high season, uh, where it's, it's not their typical high season. However, because of the, uh, the holidays, they see a bump, but it's not, there's not a ton of tourists. Obviously when we were at the, in the forests, especially up in Volcanoes National Park, there were other people like us who were traveling uh, to see the gorillas. And down in Nyungwe, it was a lot lighter. Nyungwe is about five and a half hours, beautiful drive around the lake uh, to uh, Kivu, Lake Kivu, to Nyungwe. Um, now, there weren't a ton of people there. On our gorilla trek, there were about seven of us in our little group, which is the maximum for any gorilla trek. And uh, as far as seeing a lot of tourists here in Kigali, not a ton, not a ton. We definitely stand out in the crowd. They're they're mostly locals. So uh, I mean, in, at the Marriott here, it's pretty it's pretty empty when we go down for dinner, etc. 
Have you educated uh, any fellow trekkers or tourists about veganism? Well, not necessarily. I mean, a little bit. We've had some conversations with some fellow travelers, one of whom was already vegetarian, and we talked a little bit about veganism, but not a ton. She's an animal lover as well, and we had some really nice conversations about animals in general, and she's incredibly compassionate, and uh, she's taken my information, so who knows what will happen from that. Um, I did a great little video with our tour guide, our driver guide, and you'll see a little bit more uh, of that when I put it out. But Safari, who was our our, our tour our tour guide, um, the entire time we've been here in Rwanda, and yesterday we said goodbye to him because we're just here on our own now in Kigali. He uh, pretty much ate vegetarian the whole time. I mean, I want to say vegan because whenever we ate, it was vegan. I don't, you know, I don't know what he ate when he left us, but. Um, but he said he's been eating vegetables all week and no meat, and he's been really, really enjoying it. And when I asked him if he had any questions for me, uh, for any of us, um, at, about vegetarianism, he said, he said, I don't because I agree with not hurting animals. We need, to, we need to help animals and we need to save animals. So I have nothing to ask because I already agree with what, with, with what it's about. <laughs> like, like if that doesn't just summarize what being vegetarian and vegan is all about, I don't know what does. Cause he was just like, no, I, it's the right thing to do. We should help animals and not hurt them. So nope, I'm good on that count. <laughs> like he wasn't like, what about protein and what about this and what about that? Because I don't think anybody else obsesses over those things other than Westerners. Um, uh, you know, every micronutrient we put in our bodies. I think, I don't think anybody else obsesses over that kind of stuff. So it was just really beautiful and really simple. Just a really simple summary of what being vegan is about, which is just let's not hurt anybody. It's that basic. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let's see. And then finally, I'm going to take Suzanne's question. Obviously, so much has changed there. You seem very comfortable and safe there traveling around. Yes, Suzanne. And, you know, the time when it was the least safe was really was when it was the least safe for fellow Rwandans back during the genocide. Rwanda is a very safe city. I even talked to Safari about um, crime, just crime in general. And he said, you know, there's pretty much not crime here. Like there's like, there might be like petty little things that happen or fights between each other. He said, you know, where there's just things happening between each other in, in disagreements, he said, but there's no crime here because the genocide was so traumatic for everyone in this country. I mean, this affected every single person in this country, whether you were a Hutu or a Tutsi, you knew someone who was killed brutally or raped or orphaned, the, everyone was affected in this country. It was the most brutal, violent, traumatic, hideous massacre at, over a three month period. In three months, one million people were killed in the most horrific ways and tortured and maimed and raped and it's so traumatic to just, it's unfathomable for us to even understand what they've gone through. So in that way, in that sense, it, uh, people are kind of done, like they're not interested in hurting, you know, hurting each other. And a lot of that has also come from the leadership in this country. Um, Paul, um, uh, um, I just forgot his name. <laughs> I've been saying it all week and I just forgot his name. Uh, I know his name. I'll think of it in a second. So, um, so it's, 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 uh, it, it, I, we feel very safe. We feel very safe. I mean, there's a lot of children who come up and they ask us for money, you know, just that as we're driving through the cities, but it's so cute because they're just like running after the, the van and they're waving and saying hello. And then they might say money, 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 money. Uh, that's just, you know, kind of par for the course. Cause we're obviously tourists. We're obviously not from here, but, um, but no, like walking down the street, it's just, it's just lovely. We feel completely safe. And, you know, as women feel completely safe walking around here. So Rwanda, Rwanda is a very special place. And I, I can only speak for Rwanda at this point because it's the only place that I've been. But of course, there are places we know not to go in this great, huge continent called Africa. We would not be going to the Central African Republic right now, for instance. We chose not to go to Congo because of the instability happening there. Probably wouldn't go to Burundi right now. I'm not sure I'd go to Cameroon. 
uh, you know, there's parts of Uganda I wouldn't go to, but I, I think we would. I mean, we'd go back and go into the different national parks in Congo probably another time, but we really chose to stay in Rwanda and feel completely safe and happy about that. And it's just been wonderful to really immerse ourselves in the Rwandan culture. There's no better way to get to know people in a city, in a country, uh, than spending some time there and with them. So. Rwanda is where it's at. I like you'd think I'm on like the Rwandan tourism board <laughs> and I'd be happy to join because I, I'm saying this all from my heart, feel very sincere and authentic about it. So that is all I have to say. Keep following my posts. I have many more videos to put out about regarding your questions. But again, if you want to go find out exactly kind of what our itinerary is and, and kind of how, how we planned and prepared, and then of course I'll do a follow-up podcast with Food for Thought. And thank you for supporting Food for Thought. You know, I'm going to be, all this is, all this that I've been sharing with you is part of my work. And so, you know, supporting my work makes this possible. Supporting the podcast makes it possible. Now that I'm working on animology, my new podcast, you know, doing any food for thought episodes definitely adds a strain. So if you're able to become a supporter, um, that would be uh, really fantastic. I'd be most grateful. And of course, there's perks for you as well. But I do plan on doing a follow-up episode um, about everything. And I'm doing all these short videos that you can watch too. And, uh, and of course, all of the photos that we're putting out. So go listen to that podcast. Go check out my website and uh, and keep enjoying the videos and the photos and keep asking questions and I'm sure there's questions that haven't been asked that I'm happy to answer and it was at least wonderful to share this with you this morning so have a good night because I know for many of you it's nighttime for some of you it's not it's morning and have a good day and I'm looking forward to having another wonderful day with our friends and if you're interested in the Thailand trip we do have a few more slots left I'm obviously going to try and fill those up when I get back um, we have about five or six more slots left for our trip to Thailand. And if you want to travel with some pretty awesome vegans, I'm not kidding you, the four of us kind of really love, we love so many aspects of traveling, meeting people, eating wonderful food, participating in cultural activities, obviously participating in animal protection. And we'll be doing that on the Thailand trip. So if you want to come on our Thailand trip, there is plenty of time to save. And uh, I would join now because we filled up pretty quickly for the first 15 slots. We've got five more. And, uh, and I'm really looking forward to traveling with you. So if you want to come with us to Thailand, we're going to be in Bangkok. We're going to be in Chiang Mai. We're going to be in Phuket. It's going to be pretty awesome. Yay, Tina. Tina's also coming. So we have two people on this, on this live broadcast is coming with us. It's going to be fantastic. And we're, we're kind of awesome to travel with. We're kind of pretty awesome and fun. <laughs> so we laugh a lot. We laugh so much which is really lovely. So you can go to uh, ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com to find out more about that trip under events, or you can just go to CPGTrips.com. So have a wonderful day, everybody. I will talk to you soon for the animals. Thank you so much for watching.